Um, my name is Frank Voris, and I'm with the African Wildlife Economy Institute at Stellenbosch University. And I'm really, really thrilled you could join us for this session on empowering Zimbabweans to forage, fish, and hunt to use their natural resources or to use their natural capital, if you prefer that term. It's the fourth in a series of um, discussions we've had about um, what next for the wildlife economy in Zimbabwe. Uh, we had, I'll, I'll put links in the chat box in, in a minute. We had um, started this with a session live in Vic Falls in May that was wrapped around the topic of wild foods. And then we looked more broadly in a session in June about um, opportunities. Uh, last week, we looked at um, setting up um, enterprises at the community level. This week, we're looking at empowering um, uh, Zimbabweans to use their wild resources. And next week, we'll look at export opportunities. And the whole series is designed to, to support discussions around moving forward with unlocking the wildlife and economy, hopefully in the context of the release of the country country's biodiversity economy report, which isn't out yet, but when it gets comes out, it'll be a very useful report for everybody to use to push the discussion forward about um, all the fabulous opportunities on um, wildlife enterprise, job creation, exports, etc. So uh, I'll put a couple links in, as I say in a second, but I'm going to turn it over to Victor Maposhi. Victor's at the African Leadership University School of Wildlife Conservation, which is um, based up in um, Kigali. He's one of the lecturers there, and uh, but he's a, he's a fellow Zimbabwean to many of you on the call. So Victor's going to facilitate the discussion, introduce the speakers. And I'm going to sit back and enjoy the enjoy the discussion like the rest of you. So off we go, Victor. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Frank, for. Uh, for the introduction and for the background. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. For, thank you for joining. Um, like like uh, Frank has said, um, our conversation and dialogue today is centered around empowering uh, Zimbabweans to forage, uh, fish, and hunt um, within the context of natural capital. Um, and and I would, I would want us all uh, to appreciate the presence of Nyarai um, Purebwaseka, uh, who, is, who is part of the panelists today, who is going to be um, talking um, in relation to uh, making sure that we are able to explore options and opportunities to forage, uh, fish or hunt um, and empower local communities in Zimbabwe and Nyarai um, is a managing director for Kazan Natural Oils, and and we're looking forward to 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 tapping into her experience and knowledge uh, in regarding to the subject matter today, and and the second uh, panelist is uh, uh, is Richard uh, Ferguson. Uh, Richard is uh, uh, is a fellow Zimbabwean who is based in South Africa. Um, he works for South Southern African Wildlife College, um, and a development and research manager there. Um, and, and he he would be happy to share with us his experience relating um, uh, to conservation uh, issues around uh, around natural capital, uh, sustainable resource use, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Nobuhle uh, is also joining us again, a fellow Zimbabwean who is uh, with Zimpax, but at the moment uh, affiliated with FAO. Um, she, she is into fisheries management and, and happy to explore uh, issues around fish, uh, fisheries, and 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 the exploitation of fish, and how we can tap into uh, into that resource uh, as uh, as as part of our uh, empowerment program in order for us uh, as Zimbabweans to benefit from our natural capital. And so, thank you so much, uh, uh, Nyerai, uh, Richard, and 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 Lobutle for joining and and being the panelists for today. And um, our colleagues who have joined. Uh, at this dialogue this afternoon from all walks of life. Um, I want to take you back to 2019 um, at, at the Africa's uh, Wildlife Economy Summit in, in Vic Falls. And, and in Vic Falls, the community leaders uh, uh, highlighted that they would uh, need to reset the agenda uh, for community-based natural resources management uh, to turn wildlife into a natural resource uh, engine 
and and this is something that that was very very intentional that was that came out very strong in 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 that conference uh in that summit to say that how can we turn our natural capital into a rural economic uh, engine um because for economic growth to be something that is uh, sustainable to be something that people appreciate uh, the local folks needs to benefit and they need to see the benefit on the table so this is something that we are going to explore and talk about today and 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 say since 2019 how far are we um what are the strides that we have made um what is it that we have done so far in order for us to drive uh, that agenda in order for people or communities um, to benefit and tap into their natural capital, number one. Number two, how do we empower the Zimbabwean communities to manage and benefit from their world resources? So we are going to, to look into that question again. And so number one, um, how far have we gone in ensuring that we tap into our natural capital and make sure that um, the rural economic engine is centered around our natural capital. Number two, how can we empower these communities in order to manage their and benefit from their natural resources? How can they tap their natural resources or tap into natural capital, ensure that they contribute into the national fiscus, uh, a, a national GDP, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the number three, um, in that summit, the leaders also wanted to make sure that we are able to promote uh, and uh, investment uh, um, partnerships in community-owned wildlife economy. So we also want to explore and look at how far have we gone? Oh, what is it that we are doing as Zimbabweans from a policy perspective, from the private sector, from also from, from, from government? Um, what is it that is being done in order for us uh, to be able to promote investment opportunities uh, and partnering with communities in order for, for us to drive the wildlife economy? And then number four, the most critical uh, one, what can government do uh, to attract private investment in community-based wildlife economy? I see we all coming from different backgrounds, um, but at the same time, we appreciate that we should as Zimbabweans benefit from the national, the natural capital um, because we appreciate that Zimbabwe is endowed with natural resources and from which we can all benefit from and drive growth in terms of our economy. So these are the, the broad themes that we want to explore and look at today, uh, this afternoon. Uh, without much ado, I would like to to zero in on, on, on Richard, um, I, 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 want, I want you to, to explore um, and, and, and look at um, how, how do you look at sustainable resource use, um, sustainability issues around issues of natural capital uh, from, your, from your experience as a Zimbabwean, as somebody who is into training, somebody who is into governance, somebody who is into wildlife economy related uh, uh, capacity building initiatives, um, can you set the tone? Um, and, 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 and I'm giving you five minutes uh, to explore these issues. Um, uh, thank you, over to you. Thank you, Victor and Frank, and good afternoon to uh, colleagues here on the call. Uh, Victor, yeah, stop me at five minutes, if you will. Um, you know, I, I'm well aware of the need for timing here. So, yeah, very generally, um, we have, you know, we are using the word wildlife uh, in this context. We're using it in the context of, for example, the uh, Wildlife Economy Institute. Um, it's bigger than wildlife. You know, my first point is, you know, what we are dealing with here, and uh, we have it have exactly the same sort of focus here at the college. Again, that's kind of a misnomer. It's not just a wildlife college. Um, it is a 
its natural resources defined broadly, including ecosystem services and so on, unless we have that base, and I'm talking energy, soils, water, the water cycle, the elements that make up um, biological life, diversity throughout from microfauna right up to elephants, um, vegetation diversity, and, and then products from those. Those are the resources. We need to broaden our thinking uh, away from just the suite of charismatic wildlife. So that was my first sort of uh, point on this. The second is, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use Zimbabwe obviously as an example. Um, population estimates vary a little bit for, for Zimbabwe. You know, they're talking 15 to 16 million, of which 65, 70% are rural based. And in other words, they are living and uh, providing their sustainable, their, 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 their sustenance. Um, largely from local resources. So, you know, you put those two together, you're talking 10 or 11 million people in rural Zimbabwe who are sheltering themselves, feeding themselves, providing themselves with, with water and so on from local resources. That's increasing as well. I mean, Zimbabwe in general is population increases at one to two percent per annum um, off a resource base that is pristine. Um, and, you know, looking in a little bit more detail at that, and it's not pristine, even in the protected areas, um, nowhere, I don't think anywhere on this planet almost is, is pristine. So we have a already degraded to an extent set of circumstances and resources with which to work. You know, if you take soil, and I'm, I'm just using that as an example, because I uh, am developing more and more of a research interest in in soils and vegetation because they are the base level upon which everything else works. If we don't look after those, then we're heading downhill badly. Um, we're heading to a, a less and less sustainable kind of environment. You know, you can go back to uh, a publication out of the University of Zimbabwe by Richard Whitlow in the late 80s called Land Degradation in Zimbabwe. You know, and that summarizes the history of what information there was from the early 1900s. Um, so it's not a new problem by any means. It's, it's a problem that originated under colonial uh, rules. So as much as they were designed to conserve uh, and even preserve, there was clearly something not working properly because it wasn't necessarily achieving that. It was, there's still uh, bare ground, there's still erosion happening and so on. So it, 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 they've, they've missed it somewhere down the line. Um, so, and the, the drivers of that essentially, you know, if you look at it now are some of which we can deal with and some of which we can't within our sphere of what we do as ecologists and resource managers. Um, poverty, you know, most of these things are driven by poverty among the rural population covering basic needs, either directly or indirectly from, from resources. Um, the legal framework, commons resources and so on, to what extent do those uh, provide for or encourage or facilitate the degradation, the individual use. But then again, on the other hand, we in current usage are encouraging and trying to develop entrepreneurship within uh, communities. Education. Desperately, desperately, I mean, that, that, that we're a part of a training institution um, and it's so, so obvious to us all the time that the level of biological, geographical knowledge coming out of schools is obviously variable among the SADC countries, but certainly in our particular circumstances here, it's shockingly bad. Um, you can't expect people to respect their resources and use them effectively if they don't know or don't care. Um, so the education is desperately needed. Climate change obviously is a driver of, 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 of degradation currently, more and increasingly so um, over the last couple of decades. And then obviously just the rates of consumption or the rates of population growth. So, you know, those are the drivers, those are the problems. And I, you know, I was using soil as an example and soil degradation as, a, as an example. The same applies to all of the other resources. 
how what are the solutions what are the solutions to empowering both the conservation and the use of those things and basically this is responsible resource use this is what we are trying to teach here and responsible you know how is responsible different to sustainable um, this is kind of the question basically sustain responsible use has four components it's holistic in other words it respects and works within the interconnectedness of all of these variables that we're dealing with it's ethically sound now your ethics and my ethics may vary a bit um, but we all have a basic understanding inbred within us of what is good for us as a society and what is not what's within the rules and what's not be they written or unwritten rules um, it has to be inclusive you know this is the folly of many years of colonial rule is that it wasn't inclusive it, people have to be at the center of these decisions that we make and to take it from the realm of sustainability because all of those things i've just said can all be uh, can, you can you can put the label of sustainable on all of those Re it has to be regenerative to make it responsible you have to do something somewhere in this process to address and reverse wherever possible uh, the resource losses uh, be they potential or actual um, so that involves regenerative agriculture or some form of, of trying to to reverse it so in terms of empowering people you know my, my summary out of this is education and understanding use of indigenous knowledge and traditional uh, limits albeit the fact that you know we're now dealing with a lot more people than we those traditional limits and traditional structures were arose and were, were, were put together through the history of people in the country and those were dealing with a lot fewer people than they are now obviously legislation and rules are still required to an extent and then incentives and disincentives now largely incentives and disincentives are commercial so this brings us back to the wildlife economy um you know and and where how do we satisfy basic human needs uh with you know in a way that achieves these things so yeah that that kind of sets the scene from my perspective um responsibility and responsible resource use to me is where the biodiversity policy that frank touched on earlier frank and, and victor touched on earlier in zimbabwe needs to be uh embracing all four of those characteristics uh victor yeah i can stop at that point and and you know you can open it to to other people's questions or thought or comments and so on uh or to nyaraya and, and Nabokle. richard thank you so much for for that broad based approach to looking at the issues that um, as Zimbabweans, we we have to explore. We have to to think about. Um, you you talk about a broad based understanding of ecosystem services. For us to benefit from nature, we need to understand how nature provide us those resources. Without that understanding, it would be difficult for us to make any economical projection from natural capital, just like any business. If you don't know the inputs, uh, the processes, you won't be able to understand your profit margin or your profit value. And, and, and therefore, there's something that you, you, you indicate there. It is important for us to have um, an understanding of nature itself, the ecosystem services themselves, beyond the charismatic species that many people think of or talk about. You also talk about issues to do with education. And, <clears throat> and that in order for us to be able to achieve these things, people need to know. And, and therefore, education takes center stage. I'm building up on your on your background to say that people need to know if we are into empower people today, 
about the world life economy and how based they can benefit from their natural capital. It means they need to know how they need to be educated. We need education, right? So that's, that's number one. And you talk about the challenges that are there, broad-based challenges, climate change, overuse, overharvesting, habitat destruction, a whole lot of, of, of issues. These are drivers of species loss or drivers that will chase away that broad base resource that we can benefit from and make profit, profit from. And in this case, you then later highlight how base we can address those by embracing issues to do with responsible resource use. It has to be holistic, it has to be ethical. You then went on further and talked about indigenous knowledge systems within the traditional limits, within this, this the norms and, 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 and set up of every society that we have in order for us to be able to benefit and appreciate our resources, we should respect our traditions. You then go on and talked about uh, the responsibility of each and every one of us to make sure that this is this happens. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause it here. Uh, if there are people who have questions or points of interventions about what Richard has said, which is very, very critical and, and the root on which we can build on how we can empower our own people in order for them to benefit from our natural capital. Uh, please drop them in the channel um, on, on the chat box and, and we can actually reflect on them or we can uh, call on you uh, to speak on them later on. Um, one of the things that we can benefit from nature and how we can empower people, or our indigenous people in Zimbabwe, are things to do with non-timber forestry products. We must be able to tap into nature. There are many people who think that when people talk about wildlife economy, it's all about elephants and lions and hunting. And they think about my brother Charles here, who has joined. Campfire. And they think campfire is all about hunting. And today, our conversation and the dialogue is wildlife economy is too broad to be limited to the scope of hunting. That's why Nyerai is here today. And we would want you, Nyerai, to give us in five minutes your views and thoughts about how best Zimbabweans can tap into our natural capital as Zimbabweans and how we can take this further to look and explore and diversify the world life opportunity, economy opportunities that are there based on your experiences and what your organization is working on. Thank you very much, Victor um, and Frank and the organizers of this dialogue. So I'm coming from the pri private sector um, that is actually um, capitalizing on uh, the wildlife economy. Uh, like Victor says, when uh, people talk about wildlife, we tend to think of the big five. We, uh, as a company, are um, trading in what we call the big hundred. The big hundred um, is, consists of uh, plant species, uh, nothing related to the animals, but all from the wildlife as well. We are a company that is involved in trade of um, uh, indigenous plant-based products that are wild harvested. Um, so we are trading in oils um, and a few other products that are uh, considered as cosmetic ingredients. And these are harvested from the wild by rural communities throughout Zimbabwe. So um, as a company, uh, we obviously see the value in our natural resources or in the wild species and uh, also see the value um, in the 
communities that coexist with these wild species. Um, so the communities that um, coexist with these wild species are involved in the harvesting and they trade the raw materials with us. So uh, by so doing, they make money from the wild. Um, and this is where, where the wildlife economy comes from. So unless people understand the value of um, a resource, they are not, they don't always want to protect it or they don't manage it well. So when we go into communities, we provide training to the rural farmers in sustainable harvesting and in management of um, the environment from which they are harvesting products from. So some of the products that we are currently harvesting include, uh, include baobab, marula, uh, the wild melons, um, the wild plum, uh, and a few others. Um, but obviously these resources don't exist on their own. Um, they exist with other species and they also exist with wildlife. And um, unless there's a balance between, you know, what people are using and consuming and also what the wildlife uh, is utilizing, then you also ha you, you have human, human, human wildlife conflict. So we try to create a balance between what people will consume and what the wildlife will also consume, the, the animals. Uh, because if you take, for an example, let's use marula for an example. If you take out all the marula from the forest and there is no marula for the elephant to eat, the, er the elephant is going to come for your crops. So there needs to be a balance uh, amongst all stakeholders, as we call them. So the baboon is a stakeholder for the baobab. We have to consider him when we are talking about harvesting baobab. The monkey is also a stakeholder for the wild plum. Uh, so you need to take him into consideration when you harvest the wild plum um, for commercial purposes. So um, that's, uh, that, that it is, that's it. Um, that, that is pr primarily what we do. I like um, a lot of what Richard has said because um, that is actually quite relevant to, to the things that, to, to our day-to-day um, activities, education plays a very important role. Um, so the farmer or the rural farmer um, who is involved in harvesting, um, if he is not well educated or in what it is that he has to do, uh, we have a problem. The over harvesting or over exploitation can be a challenge if they do not know um, the problems that it will cause or the, if they are not um, um, trained in sustainable harvesting, the way they harvest, how much they harvest and where they harvest um, is key. Uh, and also how much they should harvest is, is key. So um, uh, he also meant, he also talked, he talked about yeah, over harvesting and then the education, uh, which is uh, something that we, we, we are big on that's um, that those are some of the activities we are involved on, in. Um, we work with um, the government departments on the ground and in, in, we have the forestry commission here, uh, Emma to a certain extent, um, and also the rural district councils uh, because the, they, are the, they, they are the custodians of these um, natural resources. But um, we find that they, instead of them supporting us, we are the ones who actually support them uh, because they tend to be under-resourced. So uh, it, is, it is a partnership and it, it is um, necessary. Um, so th there, is, there is a lot more that could be done by, by these departments, the Forestry Commission and the Rural District Council to support um, enterprises or businesses like ourselves and also to support um, the communities um, so, so that we, you know, we can have a functional um, wildlife economy. Uh, I, I think you know, the, 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 there's probably going to be a time you know, where we can talk about you know, what it is that can be done 
to improve what's currently happening. But yeah. Thanks for that. Um, because the conversation is getting more interesting. Um, um, you, you sort of picked on from what Richard has said. Richard talked about ecosystem services, understanding the ecosystem services beyond the charismatic, the raw and ensuring that people appreciate and understand what capital is and what needs to be done in order for people to tap into their natural capital, um, the role of indigenous knowledge system. And these are things that you also tapped into as well. Um, and the beauty is that you then say that we don't look at the big five, we look at the, the big hundreds. I'm looking at these species that are not animal based, but these are plant based related species that we can tap into as part of our natural capital. Um, and 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 you you then also uh, then went on to to talk about uh, rural communities that unless they see value or uh, value a particular resource they have to see they have to attach a particular value to a particular resource if it is a tree they have to attach a value to that tree if it is a species an animal they have to attach a value for them to look at it as if they are looking at it at their maize crop in their field or at their cattle or their <laughs> livestock uh, in their area that they, they, they are managing. And so we, we need to think about that and, and how then do we make our communities and the rural people appreciate and understand that when they see a baobab tree, they are seeing a tree such as a mango tree from which they can harvest and trade every summer. When they see, in the case of Richard, when they see an elephant or a leopard, or a, they're looking at a cattle that they can actually milk and get milk out of it and, and sell milk, fresh milk and sour milk. And then after some time, annually they are able to trade of their livestock at a marketplace and are able to benefit. And for that reason, they have to protect that species or that individual animal. That's the very same concept that we are building up. And, 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 and Nyerai, um, you then went on and, and, and say that we said the plants and the, to say that we are about sustainability here. Sustainable resource management or resource use, sustainable resource use. You relate the baobab, the amarula, and the wild melon, um, or the plum, and relate it to, to the elephants for the marula, relate it to the, bab, uh, to the baboon, um, and the baobabs relate the uh, the world uh, uh, plums to the monkeys, and that in indicates and demonstrates sustainable rooting or thinking, and that we are now looking beyond just the animals, also but the the plants themselves. And so when we then look at it from this holistic perspective, to say that. When you harvest, you must make sure that it is sustainable in order for there to be a balance. So it, 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 this is something that, that, that is very critical and very important, unless we fall into the trap of human wildlife. <coughs> um, sorry, excuse me for that. So the aspect of over harvesting, you mentioned it. This relates also to issues of, of wildlife and trophy hunting, et cetera, over harvested. And then you talked about education, which Richard emphasized. And then you talked about how do you then action or work together with your stakeholders in government and within society, such as the Environmental Management um, Agency, Emma, uh, the Forestry Commission, the Rural District Councils, and how these 
at some point or some stage, in some instances, they are under-resourced. These are, these are the organizations or these are the partners who are supposed to be resourced enough in order to make things happen. Our next conversation is how do we make things happen? How can we make these organizations resourced enough in order for them to promote sustainability, to promote resource use, sustainable resource use for us to grow our wildlife economy? We need to look into these dynamics and say, how based can we as stakeholders, um, uh, non-profit organizations, how based can we support? It's everything is not about money, but we can support. And you finally kept your conversation around supporting communities. If communities feel that they are supported and they are they are capacitated communities who go all the way to demonstrate that they are able to own, use, and manage their own resource and contribute to the national fiscus. And, and with this, I, I would like to request you, Nobutle, <coughs> with your background um, from Zimpax and also the work that you are doing with uh, FAO, relating to fisheries. Richard talks, talks about ecosystem services, uh, animals, plants, etc. In a broad, in a broad perspective, and Nyara is talking about plant-based resource. And you coming in to talk about fish, how best can we empower our communities, our local people to tap into um, the fish as a resource um, to contribute to the wildlife economy in Zimbabwe. Can you share your experiences, please? Thank you. Thank you, Victor, and uh, good afternoon uh, to others that joined uh, later. Yes, um, so as Victor has already mentioned um, from the fisheries background. So when I was in, invited for this uh, event, I uh, for this virtual meeting, I actually asked, uh, why am I invited to a wildlife economy talk? I'm a fisheries person. What will I talk about? So, yeah, as you may know, uh, last year, the government of Zimbabwe actually announced uh, that uh, the department created the Department of Fisheries under the Ministry of Agriculture. Yes, that actually created problems and issues, uh, especially with Zimpax, who actually have uh, some of the water bodies like Lake Kariba, uh, Tokemkosi, uh, Lake Chivero, Dawandal, uh, Lake Kyle, uh, that are gazetted as impacts. So it were, the problem was quickly sorted and it were, the government then announced that uh, water bodies that are gazetted as uh, recreational parks or national parks will remain under national parks. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, the management of fisheries. Uh, so in the context of the wildlife economy, I'll probably dwell on the fisheries um, um, under national parks. And since my background is, uh, is from Lake Kariba. Yes, so we actually have a number of challenges. As you may know, if you catch fish today, tomorrow you'll be having money in your pocket. If you catch fish today or tonight, in the morning you'll be selling your fish and you'll have money in your pocket. That alone creates a problem for fisheries managers because uh, the demand to earn livelihood through fishing uh, is, 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 is high, especially given the performance of the economy of Zimbabwe. So there's increased demand to catch fish for livelihood. Yet, um, these water bodies can accommodate um, specific uh, numbers based on ecological and uh, fisheries research. The, uh, only a certain number can be allowed to fish. I'll give an example, uh, like for carpenter fishing, the lake can only accommodate uh, 500 boats, the entire lake uh, with 275 on the Zambian side and with uh, 
275 in the on the Zimbabwean side. That's for Lake Kariba. But then uh, Zimbabwe actually at the moment has about 450 boats and Zambia has uh, approximately 1,300 boats versus the 225 and the 275 that I mentioned. So those are some of the challenges that we are having. And as a result, uh, the catches or what each person catches, uh, then uh, we call it the catch per unit effort has declined. And so people start complaining that uh, the catches have declined. We are no longer able to pay permit fees. It's the same even for the small scale artisanal fishery. I know most of you know them as Mabrim. Yes, those are what we call the small scale artisanal fishery. We also have a similar fishery on the Zambian side. So, but we also have aquaculture ventures. Uh, on the Zimbabwean side, we only have one at commercial scale, which is Lake Harvest. I'm sure most of you have seen Lake Harvest fish even in the supermarkets, including their processed uh, fish in form of fillets, you've seen them in the supermarkets. So those are some of the challenges that we are facing in the fisheries management, the increased demand uh, to, to catch fish for livelihood. And then also we now have uh, climate change, which has um, now reduced the productivity of most of our water bodies. Um, I will, I'm not going to explain the scientific processes, but the increased temperatures have affected the productivity of these water bodies. Yet the demand uh, to any living through, um, through fishing has also increased. We also have challenges. I, I think the previous speaker mentioned um, issues of um, crops being eaten by animals. Um, those very animals, we're also having a challenge of wildlife, human wildlife conflict. So if people that live uh, in fishing communities mainly live close to the water bodies, uh, just close to the lake. And as I mentioned earlier, that these water bodies are actually gazetted as national parks. That means there's also wildlife uh, on land where they live. So that creates also a lot of challenges. In the water, there are men eating crocodiles and uh, hippopotamus, sometimes there are cases of loss of life, attack, and then even the destruction of, of fishing gear uh, for fishers, is, is, that happens due to crocodile attacks. People lose their nets, they lose their boats due to attacks by wildlife. So some of, these are some of the uh, management challenges that we have. So, and, and also have an uh, issue of, um, the institutions, uh, the institutions around uh, the fisheries, maybe I would talk of fishery dependent communities and how the, the, their institutions are. For example, in, in Lake Kariba, we used fishers in the, back in the 90s were organized into what are called sub area fishers associations. So over the years, these associations um, uh, became dysfunctional and uh, that alone also creates management challenges because the fishery manager now has to deal with just everyone. So uh, as, as Victor mentioned that I'm currently with FAO. So we have had a project uh, formulated that is assisting the government of Zimbabwe in resuscitating some of these core management structures. In fisheries, we call them core management, but I know in with uh, in terrestrial, we probably call them community based management or campfire, something like the campfire model. So in fisheries, we have what is called co-management. And so we've managed to resuscitate the co-management structures uh, in Lake Kariba. And um, we, we have the sub-area fishers associations, even the district fishers associations. We are working with the rural district councils like the Nyami Nyami and the Binga. I think since I was only given five minutes, maybe for now I can stop here since I've given the background of the challenges uh, that uh, we are experiencing with the fish and affecting the availability of fish for our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this. Uh, unfortunately, the first part of it, I missed it because I, I, I had a technical glitch here. Um, but the greater part of it, you um, you indicated and you 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 mentioned it. Um, you 
you talked about things that are at the core of my heart. When I was growing up, my, my grandmother, I grew up with my grandmother and, and we would go fishing. I mean, harvesting fish at household level for us to survive and for us to have a source of thought. That's number one, small scale uh, fisheries project or fisheries programs uh, that, 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 that are not comparable to the magnitude of what you talk about when you, you mention lake harvest. And, and, and thank, you, thank you for that. But you say that there are many other challenges that are there that release to the increase the demand for livelihoods. Um, but with the challenges of um, climate change, the productivity is low. Um, there are issues to do with human and wildlife conflicts within these very particular areas where most people are able to acquire or get uh, get to fish, uh, crocodiles, hippos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but one of the things that you, in terms of commercialization, there is lake lake harvest, but in many cases there is very little mention of lake croc, right? And people think that it is all about fish, but, but we can talk about crocodiles as well, right? Which is a high foreign, foreign income earner for the country, crocodiles. Mm. You then talked about co-management. You talked about in Kariba, in Binga, and the associations that are there in Nyami Nyami and Binga. How about the inland fisheries cooperatives that you find? In 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 in, in Dowendale, that you find in Norton, um, and and now with the with, with the the Tug Tugimkosi uh, dam, um, you know those things. How can we empower local communities to be able to benefit, group themselves, form cooperatives, and at least become formal and contribute to the national fiscus fiscus something that is formal, and at least people can contribute. <laughs> through taxes. This, this is a conversation that we have. We are running out of time. Um, I would like to, um, to, to get back into the chat box and, 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 and say, um, <clears throat> it, it, Mike says that it seems a discussion on resource use rights and sustainable community governance and everything is not on the table here. Um, uh, Richard, your thoughts about about what what Mike is talking about? Um, it's because of time, I guess, and 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 us not being able to uh, to manage the time, and for us to be able to respond. But I want you, Richard, to to respond to what Mike is saying um, around resource use rights and sustainable community governance, because this is the core towards driving issues to do with wildlife economy. Unless they are clear resource use rights and clear governance structures, there's no wildlife economy centered around communities to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually typing back to Mike in the in the chat box, um, and I agree. We need to mine down a lot further in terms of the traditional indigenous knowledge and traditional rights limits or traditional method of limiting, controlling uh, how resources are used. You know, um, we need to get down to the detail of how actually that was determined. Was that determined just by the village head or the chief telling you that you could be in there from time X to time Y, or that you could harvest X number of baskets of marula fruit or something. Uh, and who had those rights? Were they relatives or were they, was it the whole village or was it uh, an, a select few amongst that lot? You know, I, I don't know enough of the sociology of it to have, and I don't know if the work's been done to get down to the detail of how that, now that gets more complicated because you've now got less respect for traditional authority and with a larger population. So the 
pop, you know, the, the, the problem is actually intensified. Um, so, yeah, he's right. There, there is no, I mean, what we've talked about here hasn't yet discussed the details of this. And that, and I absolutely agree. This is where we need to, because if we're going to, if we're going to talk, the, if we're going to make it work, if we're going to walk the talk um, from using indigenous knowledge and traditional limits, we have to get down to the details of how they work in this current sort of environment, degraded as it is, populated as it is, with relatively high consumption rates as it is, um, to get to that. Look, it, it, it kind of uh, mirrors Frank's comment earlier about the need for or, or how to take traditional community governance and build that into the wildlife economy um, and, and how uh, steps to try and develop that. So I don't have answers. Um, education and the getting getting to grips, getting people across the board to understand that it's not infinite, that there's a limit to this, which people do. I mean, if you go back traditionally far enough, people know that if you abuse things, they fall apart. Um, but then self, uh, you know, the, the desire to make money out of it individually rather than um, to hell with the community. I don't care about my community anymore. It begins to degrade and, and work the opposite direction to this. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> thanks, Richard, for that. Um, this, is, this is a statement that applies to both Nawutle and Nyarai. And, and uh, as a follow-up statement from Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to, to Colin um, and, and, and uh, Frank later on. And we are running out of time, but there are three issues that we need to talk about. Number one, um, you are talking about communities and not having a clear, uh, you know, structure or a clear understanding of how best we are able to achieve sustainability within within the broad view of us into the natural capital. But the greater question, Nyara Inobutle, is how is it that we are able uh, to create resource-based enterprises and be able to uh, to to make sure that people are able to create formal businesses, pay taxes, and be able to generate money flow. I, I mean, money has to flow within the economy. Unless that that happens, then there's no economy to talk about. How best can we do that? No, Nyarai, one minute each. I want you to respond to that question and 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 see how best can we can we move forward. So for me. Um, how th that can be done successfully, we've got to have a market. Um, and then we've got to have uh, the conduit to the market. Um, in, in our case, this is ourselves. And we've also got to have the resource, um, whatever, whatever it is that we want to trade. And here we're talking about the big, the big hundred. Um, and of course, there is a, a whole lot of other uh, things or factors that also contribute. We've got to have the legal structures within which we operate, um, and the social structures within which we operate. And I, I, see, I see there's a question there um, talking about the communities, and um, uh, also I think there's you know some tradi about traditional authorities and stuff. So that also bears on the success um, of you know, the, this, the, this business venture. Um, but the key is obviously the market. Without a market for a, a commodity, I think everything else that we do we, we, is, is possibly in vain because that's where the, the money comes from. Um, and also we've got to take cognizance of where the resource is and manage it sustainably to ensure that we will have supplies in future to supply to to the market, and if the market were to grow, um, how best can we manage the resource to ensure that there is also growth in availability of the resource? So I think that also brings um, in the sustainability issues, and um, all the various uh, stakeholders and all the various contributors to this value chain have to be on the same page, and we all have to be pushing in the same direction. 
uh, for sustainability, for growth, and to ensure that the incomes come. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will not, I will not comment there furthermore. And Nobu, your, your thoughts about, uh, uh, about the subject? Yes. So in the context of fisheries, so I was saying that uh, capacity building um, around uh, sustainable fisheries management, especially in the context of ecosystems approach to fisheries management, is, uh, should be promoted for both uh, fishery dependent communities and also other stakeholders that interact with fishing communities or fisher folk and also uh, for government uh, departments that are responsible for managing the fisheries resources and also uh, promoting investment, especially towards aquaculture to improve the production of fish um, should also be uh, explored or considered. Unfortunately, uh, there seems to be a high cost of production as far as aquaculture is concerned in Zimbabwe. As we have seen lake harvest uh, uh, scaling down as far in terms of production on the Zimbabwean side, but also starting and actually scaling up on the Zambian side. That alone shows that uh, there are some uh, policy or, or management strategies that should be relooked or revised so, so that we promote uh, the growth of the aquaculture sector, both at community level and even at uh, commercial level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nofle. Um, I am aware that, that we have gone past uh, by two minutes to the hour, but what I wanted to say is that thank you so much to our panelists and for, for your comments, for your insights. But there are, there are key questions that we need to consider. Frank, um, in your future programming, dialogue, in the conversations that we should have as Zimbabweans, um, as fellow Africans, do we have access rights for communities to ensure that we tap into the world life economy? Unless that issue is resolved, there's no wildlife economy to talk about. Yeah, right. These are some of the things that you grapple with every day. Access rights, issues to do with use rights, issues to do with who is responsible to drive these issues. I mean, is it is it is it um, uh, Zimpax? Is it um, the Environment uh, <laughs> Agency? Is it? Is it um, question? Are they not conflicted themselves as, as, as organizations because they're part of government? And are they willing uh, to relinquish power and, and, and give communities the rights and the power so that they are independent, so that they can tap into this? But at the end of the day, we know that if you empower people, they will do whatever it takes to ensure that their rights are protected. That their livelihoods are protected and at the same time they are able to contribute to the fiscals, which is the subject of today. Empowering local communities to ensure that they are able to tap into, into their fisheries, they are able to forage, they are able to fish. And, 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 and today I want to thank you, our panelists, um, for, for, for the conversations that we have had. Unfortunately, we couldn't manage the time. And thank you so much, Frank, for allowing us to go beyond um, 2 p.m. mark. Um, thanks, Richard. Thanks, Anyarai. Thanks, Nobutle, for your time. Uh, thanks to our, uh, our, our guests who, who joined um, the, the panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to another conversation about this so that we take forward the World Life Economy Dialogue Series. Uh, what's next for Zimbabwe? in order for us to make an impact. Thank you, back to you, Fred. Thank you everybody for joining the call. That was fabulous. Um, I think the connections between, if you will, the plant community, the fish community and the mammal community are a lot closer than we think. And we can learn from each other issues of um, getting the business structures right, understanding the markets, the value chains, embedding sustainability in the value chain. 
Nobody's got all the answers, but I think the answers are in a combination of lessons learned in all three of these sectors, if you will, the plant, the fish, and the um, the wild animal sector. Um, and my parting thought is I just love the big 100. I think it's maybe more of a big 1,000. The stacks of resources that the Zimbabweans can build from, and it's not just rhinos and elephants and lions. It's a huge opportunity. So thanks, everybody. I'll sign us off now, and we'll be in touch again. Bye.